In fact, today what I want to focus on is something that agrees very strongly with, with what uh, Bill Nordhaus just said, and that is we do need a critical, rapid, and extensive reassessment of our efforts to get things done. And meetings like this are an exceptionally good point to catch up on the latest science, to understand approaches outside of the zone niche. But we need a far more aggressive approach that we're seeing, and it largely starts with the people who are here today. So you can maybe tell where I'm going tomorrow. The points I'll cover, though, to try to illustrate this from a number of perspectives, given the dizzying number of different panels, is today I will focus on examples. And tomorrow, in my final comments, I will focus on some of the themes. Some of them are quite obvious, that we need diverse, measurable, and aggressive examples of low-carbon development strategies that can be implemented and utilized at a variety of scales, from our own personal behavior, to those of our local communities, to nations, to groups of nations. We critically need that data set that quantified, examined, kick the tires, or maybe kick the non-tires data set in hand soon, and in fact, unfortunately, well before Copenhagen, which may be tough, because we need those lessons to be on the lips of every policymaker and of the academics and industry participants in those meetings. We also recognize, and everyone here um, will agree, that energy access is critical to economic activity but that carbon access is not necessarily part of that equation. One technology to me stands out from the others, and of course every talk on energy you'll hear the experts say, diversity is our friend. One technology does stand out, and that's efficiency, and I will pay homage to it in a few minutes because of its critical role in this process. We need sustainable energy systems from poorest villages to largest nations, but that doesn't necessarily mean no carbon. There's a wide range of poor and impoverished communities where greater access to fossil fuels is a critical element of development, and it's selfish for many of us to think otherwise. We also, however, need to monetize greenhouse gas emissions to put the price on carbon that we've heard from both the first two speakers. And the final point, if I speed up a little bit, will be that Clean energy financing is the area arguably in need of the biggest revolution, and I will work hard to get to that point at the end. I put up the semi-obligatory gra graph showing the business as used to be usual, I hope, the red lines, and then the various more aggressive pathways down towards more sustainable, although certainly not guaranteed soft landing paths, i.e. those with final atmospheric concentrations at 550 or 450. Or, and I hope we have some representatives from 350.org in the audience today who will make the case for even lower levels. Even the high path requires a remarkable reduction in some high emitting uh, uh, pathways. And to get to the low emission numbers, we really need a transformation of our energy systems from some of the poorest, richest communities. It's going to be a remarkable feat. And we have been far too slow in starting it. Energy access and income go up, and we see a whole variety of benefits with more energy consumption. Again, carbon is not a necessary prerequisite. Energy access has proven to be such a story. The numbers were left off because of the uh, Mac to PC conversion, but it does just as well. This graph, famous in California, less famous in Washington, D.C. over the last eight years, more famous suddenly since November, shows electricity consumption per person in the United States with and without California. It shows the levels in New York and in California to highlight two states with very different climates. And in fact, the savings, if all of the country in the United States was as efficient as the most efficient ones, would more than make up for all energy that the US imports from off of North America. So it's a remarkable opportunity. And to think that those best U.S. states have tapped out the resource, it's far from true. Denmark is remarkably lower still and could go far lower as well. So the opportunity through efficiency, which everyone says but we quickly forget with policies that are far too weak, is dramatic and could get us very far down the pathway if we were to make energy efficiency from smallest villages to largest cities a mainstay of what we do. And in fact, to aggressively implement this 
In my opinion, a price of carbon is critically important, but many of our biggest successes have actually come through policy and legislation and standards, and it's critical to keep all of those tools in play. And to think that one tool fits all is, in my opinion, a mistake, even a tool as critically important as pricing carbon in some important ways. Energy efficiency, the reason why it's not just one of many arrows in the quiver, but a vital one, is because it has a whole set of other benefits, and I won't call them unintended consequences, they're intended consequences. It can often cost less than expected, in fact the number of energy efficiency projects that have come in under budget is a remarkable data set in itself. Energy efficiency can promote innovation and competitiveness, and it can facilitate many of the other renewable or low carbon technologies. And so to start without energy efficiency is a huge mistake. I will, as I mentioned, highlight a couple examples, mainly to illustrate the range of activities that are going on and the critical lessons that we can learn by translating these around. And one of the jobs that we need to do from physical scientists to social scientists, to engineers, to economists, to sociologists, to professors of rhetoric, to members of companies, is to take these lessons and explore them in other, setting, in other settings, but to report back on how, they, on how they pan out. And far too frequently, we don't report back. We don't quantify through analysis, through life cycle studies, through quantitative surveys, through all the tools that we talk about, some of the benefits. This is one example of a nonprofit group in Nicaragua that works on the Atlantic coast on everything from designing and building locally small wind turbines that are now being exported from these set of communities to developing and managing local mini grids and developing alternatives to some of the ways that we've done things in the past. Doesn't mean that every household member needs to be building wind turbines, but it does mean that the expertise needs to reside in a way so communities can assess not only the opportunity to bring down their own energy bills, I didn't say bring down their carbon, although that's a case when you use wind, but to look for the economic opportunities in innovating in these new areas. In fact, this group, Blue Energy, was one of the recipients of one of the CNN Hero of the Planet Awards, and it really came out of undergraduates who had taken very little beyond basic energy courses, but spent a great deal of time studying what worked and what didn't work in some rural settings. On the other end of the spectrum, in some sense, are projects on solar. And if we go down from the top to the bottom of these images, um, when I put the slide together several years ago, this six-tenths of a megawatt solar facility in San Francisco was considered large. There are now far larger facilities in Japan, in Germany, in Canada, all over. The middle one is solar panels on my roof, and I'll return to those in a second. And the bottom is with a different technology, a different and for a long time neglected form of solar, amorphous solar, the largest new source of electrification in Kenya. 35,000 systems are sold each year at this very small level. In fact, I won't describe in detail today, but I'll highlight the story that in Kenya, the market for standalone solar home systems was moving along wonderfully until the mid to later 90s when the industry uh, found that there was a huge problem in quality. And there were high quality panels and low quality panels with no consumer reports, no mechanism to evaluate until a number of NGOs began to essentially play the role of technology assessor. And they published their results not in academic journals but in the local newspaper. So the companies could see the results and in one case they sued us, in the other case they made bumper stickers saying best tested in Kenya. I stressed that before that the solar panels you saw on the buildings and on my rooftop are the crystalline solar variety. The type being installed in Kenya are these flat black, these very low efficiency but very, very low cost amorphous panels, a technology developed but then ignored in the West and then essentially restarted because of the excitement of a number of developing country markets they really found this to be a much more appropriate fit to their needs. In fact, the advertisement there is buy a solar panel and a black and white Chinese-made TV so you can watch the World Cup. 